In this tutorial, I want to have a look at uh, doing an indirect Fourier transform on your Sachs data to make your P of R function, your uh, probability of vector R function. Um, I'll go into a little bit of detail of, of what that exactly is. Um, but I'm going to use two pieces of data for doing this. Uh, so in previous uh, tutorials, I looked at reducing robot data, so statically measured data. <clears throat> I showed a BSA series from 5 to low mg per mil. Um, I'm going to use this. I'm also going to use some data that I got from the HPLC. Uh, it's BSA as well, so I'll, I'll drag that in now. Um, I said at the time BSA in solution will exist as a monomer, a dimer, uh, and a tetramer, and some higher order species. Um, and you can see that the, the robot data is much higher uh, at low Q, it's a much larger particle than the HPLC data. Um, if we go through to the analysis tab, you'll see that there's a, a dramatic difference in the radius of gyration. So, so the, the statically measured data will be very polydispersed, where the, the HPLC data will be much better. Okay, so um, now. I'll take these one at a time and I'm going to start with the HPLC data because I think that's going to be the most straightforward thing to, to do the transform on. Um, uh, we'll just have a quick look at that data again. Um, uh, and here it is. Uh, you'll notice that the, the vector here is Q and it's in reciprocal angstroms. Now what that means in practice is that the data down here at small values of Q corresponds to large distance vectors within the particle. So again, this is sort of looking at the overall size and shape. So it's, uh, the, the, the best way to think about this is imagine that you have measured, you've taken a long ruler and you're measuring your particle. So you, you can't, using this big long ruler or measuring stick uh, you're not going to get any of the fine detail of the particle, but you might be able to estimate the overall size and shape. So that's really what, what this part of the data represents here, where this data out here uh, is like you're measuring your particle with a much smaller measuring stick. Um, and so it's, uh, you're getting more of the fine detail, but you maybe don't, you, you lose some of the information about the overall size and shape, okay? But it's in a reciprocal space, um, or, or inverse scale, okay? And that means that just looking at this data, it's very hard to have a picture of what's going on in this particle, what the particle might look like. If we could put it into real space so that the, the small values on this x-axis uh, correspond to small distances in the particle, and the large values on the x-axis correspond to large distances within the particle. Um, you, you know, your brain's much better at interpreting that kind of real space data because we live in a real space world. So, um, okay, so so to do that, we need to do a indirect Fourier transform, okay? And in scatter, that is achieved by using this real space button. Now, clicking on the real space button will populate this checked data into the P of R tab. So if I click on the P of R tab now, you see that it's empty. Um, if I hit the real space button, scatter takes us through to the P of R tab, and now it's populated, and I can now move back and forth to the P of R tab and see my data. Okay, so, so here's my raw data here. And here is my indirect Fourier transform. Now, the reason it's an indirect Fourier transform is if we wanted to do a direct Fourier transform, we would have had to measure all the data. Um, so that is, uh, we would have had to measure to zero scattering angle, most importantly, um, but also to, to sort of, you know, infinite scattering angles out here. And, and clearly we don't have all the data. So what we're going to have to do is extrapolate the data to, to zero and to infinity to, to do our Fourier transform. And it's this extrapolation that is the, the, the whole trick here. Um, and think of this as a model. We're fitting a model here. So the, the P of R function isn't a sort of a direct outcome from the data. It, it's a model, okay? Um, now the main parameter that we're going to vary in fitting this model 
is the dmax, so that is the maximum vector within the particle, its longest dimension, and we don't know that, we haven't measured that directly, so we're modeling it here. Um, uh, so in doing that, there is a few things that we're going to be looking for. First of all, we want a P of R function that is relatively smooth. With any Fourier transform, you can, you can have like a dominant wave function inside the transform and you'll get this kind of wavy uh, uh, transform. Um, and so, you know, you want this to be a nice smooth function, uh, not something that looks like a, you know, a, a sine wave has been imposed on it. Um, so that's one thing, smoothness. The other one is uh, you want this uh, function to approach the x-axis here in a fairly smooth uh, fashion like this. You don't want it kind of plunging in or sort of snaking away off. You don't want to see negative values like this in it. Um, uh, we measured our radius of gyration in reciprocal space. That was our guinea fit, and you can see here it was 28. We'd like to, we can also measure the radius of gyration from this um, P of R function, and you would hope that these two are in pretty close agreement. So that's something else we're looking for. And also, uh, having transformed this raw data to the P of R function, we can then back transform the P of R function to the raw data and, and the, the fit should be good. So that's what that red line is. Um, and you can see that's also represented in this chi-score here, okay? Uh, okay, so the, the way we go about this is um, basically increasing dmax and looking at the result or decreasing dmax. I would often look at here and say, well, the, the real space radius of gyration is too small compared to the reciprocal space. So I'm gonna increase dmax to try and correct for that. Um, uh, that's one way of looking at it. Um, the other thing is, you know, you can kind of see here that this function, it looks like it wants to close up about here, you know, it's, it's kind of naturally approaching the line and then we're just uh, going to, to larger values of dmax, we're just increasing this. Um, you know, so maybe we could truncate this back to 85 and, and kind of have a look down there. Um, so, you know, this, th there's not really a, a single way of knowing where to go. Uh, just think of your dmax as your parameter that you're, you're trying to refine, okay? Now, um, it doesn't seem very stable. It's a bit bumpy. Um, I'm not really seeing a single solution that jumps out as being the right one. One possible reason for that is we're including a lot of high resolution data out here that I mean, it's so noisy that we've really not uh, measured this very accurately. And so it's probably a good idea to truncate this back and get rid of some of this noise from our data. So um, this is a really common thing to do, unless you've measured at very high concentration and have strong data right out to the edge of the plate. It's not a bad idea to, to sort of hack it back a bit. Um, okay, so you, you can see already this has gone much more smooth. Um, in truncating the data, we, we've skipped some of those high resolution terms that give you the very um, sort of uh, short wavelength um, sine functions that are contributing to our Fourier transform. Okay, um, so I mean, this is looking pretty good here. You can see our chi score is uh, not great, you know, two, that's not bad. You know, this is now looking like, like if I just keep moving this down, you'll see this is what I was talking about, the, the P of R function now approaches the line and it's kind of cutting away. Um, so, you know, somewhere around there, that looks good. That's a nice kind of smooth function coming into the line. Um, overall, the, the P of R function has that kind of nice smooth shape. Um, seems to fit the data pretty well. The chi-score is, you know, reasonably low. Um, we've got a reasonable agreement between the radius of duration real space and the radius of duration reciprocal space. So I would I would probably be happy with that. So so there's your P of R function. Um, there's a couple of other tools in here. Uh, you can use this um, button here. It just plots your data on a, on a, a different scale. Um, sometimes at low Q it can get a bit bunched up. So it's, it's sometimes useful this view. Uh, just to sort of have a closer look at what's going on, um, you know, make sure that the fit is really not bad the whole way across. Um, 
Uh, a really useful function is this refine button, and um, Rob Rob wrote this in. Uh, you can see it's a fa the, the sax curve is actually a fairly simple affair, um, and we have massively overmeasured it. We've got many many more data points here than we really need to to describe this curve. So uh, this refine button uh, applies a um, sort of statistical method um, looking at outlier points. So green is good and you can see that uh, most of the points here fit the data really well and we've just got a few excluded points at, at, at high angle. So this is telling us that our, our P of R function is really quite good. If you see a big block of red, uh, particularly down at low Q where the signal to noise is good, um, it's, it's probably an indication that your P of R function doesn't fit your data all that well. Um, but you know this looks great. Okay, now just quickly, um, I'll, I'll show you the the p of r function for this data that's poly dispersed and and not so good. Um, so again, I'm just going to instantly cut this back to a similar place than we had the the last one. Um, I think our p of r function before was around what was it 80, 85, something like there. Um, you can see that you know this is uh, we, we we have a lot of fluctuation here. The, the fit to the data just looks terrible. The, the radius of gyration doesn't match at all. So this is a, not a good solution. Look at our chi-score, it's just horrendous. Um, so, you know, let's go to something really quite a bit bigger. Um, we're kind of heading in the right direction here. Um, you know, maybe 130, something like that. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's still, it's not great. Um, uh, you know, something like something like this. I think we're probably heading in the right direction now. Um, this big tail is basically showing that uh, there's something large in the data. This will be the tetramers or or, or something like that uh, imposing themselves. Okay, so um, so I've I've gone to a, a sort of a reasonable chi score. This is reasonably smooth. With this big tail. Uh, you know, affect the data. I'm still not getting a good agreement in the RGs, uh, which is indicating that this is not a great solution. If I hit the refine button here, um, uh, you'll see we've, we've got a big block of red down here where it's not fitting, and that's just excellent evidence to say, you know, there's something fundamentally wrong with this um, uh, P of R function. Uh, okay, so. Um, this is really the hardest thing that you'll do with your SACS data. I'm not going to pretend that it's an easy thing to do. Um, there's sometimes just an obvious right answer. Uh, there's other times uh, not an obvious right answer. Um, and it, it really just takes practice playing about with these things. Um, I would also say that uh, there are other tools um, for doing the P of R. Some of the other ones, uh, common ones, if I just pull in a web browser here, um, uh, this is you know, one of the best tools, uh, if not the best, that's the website there, Bayesian app or bayesapp.org. Uh, um, there, there's a very simple interface. You can uh, browse and choose your DAT file. You can see I've loaded that HPLC data. Um, you can truncate the Q range that you want to do, and there's some other options in there as well. Um, if we just submit this, uh, it's basically going through a whole, it's, it's, it's what we just did manually, it's essentially going through a similar approach automatically. Um, you can see it's come up with a D max around 80, which is where we arrived at. Um, this is the fit to the data, uh, you get a chi score. Um, and you know that's really useful. You can download the data and, and use it. Um, even if you just use this to get yourself a, a, a starting point for for Dmax, uh, this is a really excellent tool, and I would definitely recommend that you have a, have a go with it. Uh, the other obvious one is um, in the AtSAS package. Uh, Genome um, is is the, the the program that does the uh, Fourier transform. So. Um, you know, have a crack at that. I think you just uh, run Primus, load the data in, and, and there'll be links to the real space, um, and it will run Genome. There's all sorts of automated tools in Genome as well to, to get you the best uh, P of R function it can. Um, also worth noting that 
uh, its genome that outputs the P of R function in the form that some of the dummy atom modeling programs like you know, DAMN, and DAMF uh, that, that you, they use as input. So um, at some point you may have to go through genome anyway. I think Scatter uses genome to output its um, P of R functions for those tools. So um, you know, definitely worth bearing in mind. Good. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much for listening.